लाइफ स्टोरी Let me introduce you. Peter. Some of you know is a very famous international cricketer. He was once uh, known as the world's fastest bowler. He's written a number of books. He's been a journalist. He's been in business. Done many, many things. But I'm going to let Peter share his story now. Thank you, Peter. It's good to have you back with us. Thank you. All right. Well, then let's just bow our heads. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you that finally we have connected. And I pray, Lord, that in your very, very special way, you would take what is to be shared here this evening, and I pray that you would minister profoundly. Only you can go where the soul and spirit meets in our hearts, and I pray that you would use this story to your glory. For we ask it in the name that is above every other name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It's been my great privilege. To serve the Lord for some forty years, forty years, and I remember halfway through, probably twenty years ago, one morning in my quiet time, I really got profoundly challenged by this. It was almost, it was almost as if I heard God say this to me: "Never forget where I brought you from. Never forget what you were, where you came from." Never forget your first love, because if you never forget where I brought you from, and you never forget who you were, you will never ever stand up and preach down to anyone. You will stand in the pulpit, and you will always preach up to me. And we will do that right now. We'll speak up. Born in a Christian country. Uh, so it is claimed. Uh, I've, I've heard claims of up to eighty percent of South Africans Christians. I don't know so much about that, but I was born into a Presbyterian family. My granddad, actually, at the time of my birth, was the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in South Africa, and he christened me. So you couldn't have had a better start than that. I got went into Sunday school, and I went to Sunday school until I was about 15 years old. And then my dad had an argument with the pastor, and we didn't have to go to Sunday school anymore. And our cricket, I think, improved a little bit at that stage. But who knows? Anyway, Christian background, Presbyterian. My wife, she was an Anglican. She told me that the Anglican Church was a higher church than my church. I remember going to a couple of Anglican services and understanding and understanding even less that was going on there. So it obviously was a higher church, because the higher the church, the more confused you might get. Anyway, she finally had to submit, and we got married in the Presbyterian Church, and I was a. A Presbyterian, a non-practicing one, but I had firm convictions, and 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 in, it, it was around about the time when the charismatic movement was really at at its force, and I used to call them the happy clappies. And my wife knew that we must never ever go talking about that sort of thing, the happy clappies.、Uh, let's just leave Peter alone. I didn't go to church. But she was reasonably interested in all that. Anyway, one day she got born again. It took her some time to tell me. She was, I think, a little bit uh, uh, concerned about how I would respond. Eventually, she plucked up the courage to tell me that she was born again. I don't remember exactly what I said. I think I like congratulated her. Like it's joining the country club or something like that, and you know how patronising we can be. I said, "Well, it's great that you've found something in life.、Uh, go for it. I'm right behind you." I didn't tell her quite how far、uh, behind her I was, 
but uh, she was around about the age of 40. And I assumed that this was some sort of midlife crisis and it was all part of it. Now, my wife, I regarded as a little bit of a nag. Uh, she was a good nag because I needed nagging, but she was a little bit of a nye, 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 nye. And we even had an arrangement about the nye, nye, nye. And that was that uh, if, if I got home, I was given a time seven o'clock at night because I was a busy businessman. Seven o'clock at night, I had to be home. If I was home by seven, no nye, nye, nye. After seven, nye, nye, nye. And obviously, the later you, you, you came, uh, the worse the nye, nye, nye. Anyway, she got born again, and it was about a week after uh, the conversion. I came home, I was late, I was uh, heading for a nye, nye, nye and uh, thoroughly deserving a nye, nye, nye. But as I opened the front door, there she was, and there was no nye, nye, nye. She said, hi, nice to see you. Did you have a tough day? And, you know, I sort of looked and I, I perhaps wondered whether I was in the right house. But anyway, uh, there, there was this. And I thought, well, I counted it as a, a lucky strike. At that stage, I'd been married for 17 years. And in 17 years, I think you're entitled to one lucky strike. Anyway, uh, about a week later, I had the same thing again. I came in late. And this time, uh, as I opened the front door, there she was again. Hi, nice to see you. Did you have a tough day? The kids were there. Hi, Dad. It's nice to see you. The supper was warm. The beer was cold. It's frightening. I live in a world that tells me that leopards don't change their spots. But something had happened. Something had happened with my wife, Ines. And I looked at it, and I watched it for a couple of weeks. And I remember saying to uh, one of my, my, my eldest son, Gavin, I said, Gav, have you noticed a change with Ma? And he said, yeah, I have. I know that if I had checked out with the animals, they would have said the same thing. Something's happened to Ma. And eventually I said to her, I said, Lovey, what's happened to you? She said, Peter, I told you, I'm born again. The Lord Jesus Christ by his spirit indwells me. Now, I want to tell you that that's far too complicated for a CEO of a company to understand. But that was the simple bottom line. My wife had met the Lord Jesus Christ. And You know, when Jesus Christ comes into a life, that life changes. If there's no change, there's no Jesus. It's as simple as that. And I remember I even tried to annoy her. And even as I tried to annoy her, uh, more love came out of her. And that was even more annoying. 
I remember one night uh, uh, delivering a bit of a lecture. I told her that she mustn't try and, and turn the kids into, as the word I used, the Bible punches. And then I said that one night something about Jesus. It wasn't too blasphemous. But as I said this about Jesus, she started to cry. Now, you might not think that's strange for a woman, but in 17 years of marriage, I'd never, ever seen her cry. She'd never cried in front of me. Maybe she'd had reason to cry on her own, but never. But when I say crying, I looked in her face and it was just tears running down her cheeks. And, you know, as I looked at her, looked in her face and I looked at those tears, she didn't say a word. But it was almost as if those tears said to me, Peter, you can say anything you like about anyone, but don't you dare say anything about Jesus, my Jesus. She wasn't talking about the Jesus that I'd learned about at Sunday school. She wasn't talking about the Jesus who technically heads up Christianity. She was talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who had died specially for her. And she was talking about Jesus Christ, who changes lives. She believed. She believed with all her heart and soul and mind and strength. She really believed. It wasn't intellectual. It wasn't historical. It wasn't emotional. It wasn't hysterical. It wasn't like I maybe believed like the chicks in the post, hoping that it isn't, but knowing that it might not be. She had an unbelievable hope. It wasn't just a wish, but it was an unshakable confidence. She was absolutely sure of what she hoped for and absolutely certain of what she did not see. It was radical. It was life-changing. And it was highly, highly infectious. And it was the start of, of Inus becoming something of a significant matriarchal figure in our lives. I looked at her and I knew that I knew that something had happened. And I knew, I knew that she had met Jesus, but I didn't want to hear that. I didn't want to believe that. And then one night she was now going to church. One night I was, it was about six o'clock in those days, there was only one television uh, uh, channel. It was about six o'clock and she was getting ready to go to church. She actually once asked me if I minded if, I, if she went to church. And I know that if I said I had, she probably wouldn't have gone. But I said, go, you know, the more you go to church, the more you'll walk, you work your way out of this situation. Anyway, this particular Sunday night was just before six o'clock. And she was in the bedroom getting ready for her church service because she got a lift at 6.15. And she was busy singing praise songs. She was singing about Jesus. What a wonder you are. And that is the name above every other name. And when you are running from uh, that name, that name particularly ministers to you. Anyway, I was sitting in front of the TV set and a Christian program comes on. Uh, six o'clock on a Sunday night. That's likely to happen in South Africa. The program uh, introduced, it was going to be a panel discussion. And they were, their subject for the evening was, in fact, the charismatic movement, the happy clappies, as I would call them. And on the panel was uh, 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 Reynard Bonker, the well-known evangelist. Bill Chalmers was the chairman. It was a program called Cross Questions. And uh, Reynard Bonker was there. And one of, the, one of the guys on the thing was a guy called Stephen Grenfell. I knew him very well from my journalistic days. And there he was, I knew he was an atheist and an agnostic all rolled up into one. He was a television personality. I knew that he was totally anti-Christianity and more specifically what was going on amongst the charismatics in this day. And I knew that he would have a full go and he certainly did. He called himself righteous and presumptuous. And as I listened to him, he was sort of saying everything I'd been saying to my wife, and my wife was busy singing her praise songs in the bedroom, and I thought, well, I'll soon make a difference to that, and I called out to her, and I said, Lovey, come listen, and Lovey came, and she sat next to me, and she watched for about seven minutes as uh, this guy, uh, Stephen Grenfell, led forth. 
uh, I managed to keep silent for those seven minutes. And then when he finished, I said to her, Lovey, I've been telling you the same things. It's your prerogative to believe what you want to believe. But when it's on television, it's the truth. I said, obviously, I'm a prophet in my own land. Anyway, at that time, the car arrived to give her a lift. Off she went to church. And I was left sitting on my own in front of that TV set. Grenfell had dominated the first half. And it now was Reynard Bonker's opportunity to respond. Reynard Bonker said afterwards that this guy Grenfell had really annoyed him. And that in his response, he hoped that that annoyance hadn't shown through. But as he started to speak, the camera zoomed up to his face and I never heard a single word that he said. But as I looked at him, his face just shone at me. And as I looked at that face and, and, and looked at the face that was shining at me, in a moment of revelation, I realized that what was shining out of him was exactly the same as was shining out of my wife. I realized that the Lord Jesus Christ is for real and does indwell those who love him and those who serve him. And then in the light of that revelation, the camera switched over to Stephen Grenfell and he was sitting in his chair. And as I looked at him sitting in his chair, he just got uglier and uglier. And then I had this vision one minute. Life Stories. sitting in the chair the next minute he wasn't there anymore and I was sitting in his place and as I looked at myself I saw myself for all my ugliness I saw myself like I was a pig in the gutter in the muck and the mire having the audacity from down there to point upwards and condemn Jesus Christ who I knew in that instant was for real and then it was as if my whole life came before me. My late mom and dad uh, would have probably liked to, my mom would have liked to sit down and write a CV of her two boys and maybe my CV would read three or four impressive pages. But as I sat in front of that TV set, I realized that I could take three or four pages of, of, of CV and throw them into the waste paper basket where I had to stand before God. It's a major shaker when you're an executive director of this you're a president of this and you're a chairman of this. You live in a great suburb. You've got a great job. You've got all those things. People look at your family and they think that you've sort of got it together, but you're sitting in front of that TV set. You're sitting there all on your own. Anyone sitting either side of you wouldn't have heard a word or seen a thing. But as I sat in front of the, that TV set, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I realized in a wonderful, wonderful, profound way that I was in the process of trying to gain the world, something I would never, ever do. But worse still, I was in the process of losing my soul. And then it was as if I was asked this question, what have you done with the things I gave you? God is in the people business. He blessed me with a wife and four children. What have you done with the stewardship of what I gave you? I'd come under conviction because the Holy Spirit works like that. It convicts on sin, righteousness, and judgment. And I came, I came convicted about sin, not the world's sin, but my sin. The meeting finished. And to cut a long story short, a few things happened that evening. But around about midnight that night, I went down to the bottom end of the garden. And there at the bottom end of the garden, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I didn't get any warm feelings or hear any bells ringing. But I, as I looked up and I said, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I gave my whole life to him. 
I didn't just add him on as a, as a, as a hobby. I didn't just add him on as a religion. I know that at the bottom end of the garden that night, I gave up my independent right to myself and I gave my life to Jesus. And I know that when I walked back into the house that night, I walked back never ever to be the same again. And you know, I wasn't in a hurry to tell my wife. I sort of kept it secret for a couple of days. I was coming home earlier now. I was being loved and honored at home. So I, I, I didn't stay out late. It's an amazing thing that when things change with your wife, you get into traffic jams to get home. And I remember the one night I, I, I got home and I was, I was, I, I immediately that after that, 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 that session down at the bottom end of the garden, I wanted to find out, I wanted to get some of those tracts that I sort of ordered out of the house. I wanted to read the Bible. And I remember this coming home this one in the evening and she had been reading a book on inner healing. And as I got into the main bedroom, on the main bed, there was this book. It was open on a page. And I first checked that she wasn't watching me and I sneaked up to this page. And on this page was 60 words describing sin. And as I looked at those 60 words for the first time in my life, I got 100% in an examination. I was every one of those things. And I panicked a bit. I panicked. I went to the phone and I phoned May Hauser who had been involved at the church. I knew she was a Christian. She was a Christian counselor. And I read out these words to her and I said, May, if I've got to be without all these words to be a Christian, I can never do it. And then there was like a silence. And she said to me, Peter, what have you done? Have you given your life to Jesus? I said, yes, May, Sunday night down at the bottom end of the garden. And she said, praise God. And she said, don't worry about those 60 words. You just keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you that I still, that advice still to me after 40 years in the ministry is the best advice I ever received. The amazing part of that, those 60 words was that they were all inside words, words like hate, jealousy, pride. And, you know, I realized as I looked at those 60 words that that's the real me. That's the real me, that me inside me, that's the me that Jesus Christ knows, not the me that I've paraded to the world. That's me. And I knew then, I realized that Jesus Christ died for that. And Jesus is the only one who can come into my life and take those words out. Only he can do it. Uh, things like, uh, Lord, I remember one evening, a little Sean, he was a little, a, a, a very young little boy in those days, the cricketer. And I remember going into his bedroom the one night and I was just saying, Lord, how can you forgive me for what I haven't been to my children? And yet he has, as he promises, restored the years that the locust has eaten. He has given me back my wife and my kids, but not my maid. He hasn't changed them to suit me. He's opened my eyes to see them in a different light. He's opened my eyes to see them as a blessing, a great blessing from him. You know, six years later, I was CEO of a multi-million company. Within six years, I'd given up my fancy job and I decided to go out full time to preach the gospel. And it was six years and I'll never forget the morning. I think it was my second last morning in my fancy office. I was just saying, Lord, how come? Life Stories.
Life Stories.